Good morning and welcome to this. I don't know which talk we're up to. It's about five or six or something. Oh. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about corners and bends. Now, I had a particular problem with this. And this is why there's been a long delay, because I, I kept creating the presentation and then thought corners and bends. Well, we all know about that. What else can I do? And the more I got into it, the more I started looking at accidents and statistics and so on. And it very nearly became a presentation about young drivers instead of about corners and bends. So I then interleaved the two presentations and then had to severely edit it because it could have e easily taken up all morning. So this is where this is about. It's particularly about uh, single uh, corners, bends, speed, but also interweaving single vehicle collisions, which not exclusively, but statistically, uh, are something that young people tend to do more often than more experienced drivers. And just yesterday I found this amazing quote, which I don't think she intended to be used by, uh, by motorists. A bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make a turn. I think she was talking about life in general rather than driving. But just before we go on to that, just to introduce myself, because I see there's one or two new faces here. My name is David Reeves and I look after observer training here in Northampton. Um, I'm a retired IT consultant. I took early retirement a couple of years ago when I got made redundant, and now I do various voluntary things. My first idea when I was made redundant was to train as an ADI, and by the time I got all the way through, I decided I didn't really want to do that. It was, but I, I have the badge, but I've never actually worked as an ADI. Uh, I do various voluntary things. I help in a primary school. I've now become a governor there, and I'm also a JP. Um, the original idea of these talks was that they would be part of our observer training to have a half hour talk about a particular subject, a core subject from the handbook, the observers and the uh, associates handbook to stimulate some discussion. And that's essentially what I'm doing. The very first talk by accident was advertised nationally. And so we decided to open it up because that way we get lots of experienced observers and we can have some discussion about the topic afterwards so that's that's the background to it anyway back to the plot why do we teach about bends in the first place well because a lot of collisions happen on them now as i'm going to put it here this is a kind of attempt to break the law and not quite getting away with it but the difference with this one is we're talking about the laws of physics. We're talking about Newton's first and second laws of motion, which I'll come back to. So I'm encompassing this a little bit of science, a little bit of engineering and some maths. I'm just checking the numbers to see how many leave at this point, but um, it will be limited. I'm not an engineer. I was an IT person. Uh, so the maths is limited to my A-level maths, which was taken in, uh, well, one well, or two years ago now, so uh, we're uh, um, so it's not going to get massively complicated. Oh, and the other factor, of course, is that light tends to travel in front straight lines. If you believe Isaac Newton, who believed they were particles and therefore everything travelled in straight lines, um, or corpuscles, as he called them, I think. So Isaac Newton, I told you it was going to turn into a science lesson. First law of motion states the body at rest will remain at rest. And the body in motion will remain in motion unless it's acted on by an external force. So, so we've got a car. That's our body in motion. And we're going to act on it with a force. And the second law, the force acting on an object is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. Okay. Here's a car going around a corner. A bit of cornering. So if... If we didn't have an external force, the car is going to, it won't quite be as wa wavy as that. That's me trying to draw a straight line with a mouse, but the car will just carry on straight ahead. But if we apply a force to there, let's imagine for a minute that this is like a toy car and I've got a piece of string or a rope. I can stand in the middle and I can apply a force towards the center of this curve. And the, the question really is, how much force do I need to make it go around that precise circle? Now, again, 
I don't want to hear from any actual engineers out there because my, as I say, my maths and my engineering is limited to about A level standard. And that was quite a few years ago. But basically the formula looks like this. It's that's the force you need. And it's equal to the mass of the car. So if the car is bigger, heavier, literally more massive, you will need more force. So if this is double the weight, you'd need double the force. On the other hand, we've got R is the radius of the circle. If it's a great big circle, if we double the size of the circle, well, we don't need as much force. We need half as much force. On the other hand, if we make it a much tighter turning circle, we need more force. Uh, and that's indicated by R. But the most important bit is that, is that, it's proportional or it's related to V squared. V is the velocity, it's the speed we're going around. So if I double my speed, I need four times as much force. Okay, I'm not gonna dwell on that too much, but we have an equation for the amount of force I need to pull this car round a corner. Okay, how much force have we actually got and where is it coming from? Now, I could stand in the middle of H corner with a large rope and pull them around, but clearly that's not what happens normally. Normally, it's done by steering. And so the tyres, the steering, is pulling it towards the centre. Clearly, that's what happens. That's when we steer a car. We know that. We drive cars and other vehicles. So where's that force coming from? Well, this is due to the frictional forces between the tyres and the road, and it's... Engineers are going to start getting angry now because this is massively a, 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 an approximation, but... You're doing OK, David, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for an engineer's affirm affirmation there. Here's a car sitting on the road, right? So it's got a certain mass, and gravity is acting on it. So it's pulling it down, or if you wanted Newton's second law, or is it second or third one, the road is pushing up. Either way, it's sitting there being held on the road. Now, how much friction it has, how much it kind of sticks to the road, depends on this thing. Got a Greek letter, it's mu. It sounds like a slightly strangled cat. So it's actually the coefficient of friction. If you don't like that, just call it the stickiness. How sticky is this surface? How well does it stick to it? Now, so if we have a heavier car or more massive car, I should say, it will have more force available. If we could increase gravity, which clearly we can't, apart from driving on the moon or something, but that's got a few technical issues of its own. But gravity, we can't change very much. And we can't really change the mass of the car either very much. We could take a few more passengers and a couple of bags of shopping, but that's not really going to do it. The factor is this one, mu, the coefficient of friction. Now, that depends on a number of things. It depends on the tyres. Are they, what are they made of? Uh, are they good quality? Are they worn? Are they uh, properly inflated? It depends on the road surface. Is that well maintained? Is it broken? Is it made of what's it made of? Is it concrete? Is it stone? Is it uh, tarmac? And most importantly, is there anything between those two layers? Water, ice, gravel, and so on. Now, this is, as we said, an approximation. Because let's assume this car is driving along nicely. Um, it's just going along nice, steady, whatever, 30 miles an hour. The wheels obviously are going round. Like, um, on here, let me just get my laser pointer. The, the wheels are going round nicely like this, and they're meeting the road coming the other way. Now, from the perspective of the tyre, that's meeting the uh, road at exactly the same speed. The tyre is meeting the road that's going past it at exactly the same speed which is good, because if it wasn't, we'd be skidding. But although that, so our assumption is one, the road is flat. So we're not, I haven't got any odd effects of gravity pulling us downhill or trying to push it uphill or anything weird and wonderful. The speed is constant and we're not skidding. 
But that's pretty much the case if we're driving nicely around a bend. So that'll work for, for what we want. So question now, now we know these things, how fast can we go around a bend? Now, I've drawn a blackboard here now, so everybody sitting up straight, I'm, I'm gonna be asking questions in a moment. How fast can we go around this thing? So let's, I, I wanted to have a sound effect of squeaky chalk on a blackboard as well to go <laughs> this, but I didn't quite manage that one. Um, but so the force needed has got to be equal to the actual force available. Now we've got equations for both of those things now. So we had the one that pulling it around the circle, that one, and we had this other one for how much force of friction we've got. And if I was, oh, well, we've got mass on both sides, so we can kind of cancel that out. I hope everybody's taking notes here. Uh, but we wanted to know what V was, so we can kind of solve for that one. So we have V squared, we multiply both sides by R. So we've got V squared equals that. And if so just solving for V, QED, V equals the square root of mu times G times R. Excellent. Wow. Have we still got the same number of people with me so far? Jolly good. Now you're thinking, why has he done that? What's the point of that? My point is this, that if we get a tape measure out, we know what R is. Oops, sorry, let me just go back a bit. I, uh, I was trying to get my pen there and I didn't get that. There we are. We know what R is, we can work that out. We can get a tape measure and measure the bend. We know what gravity is. And actually, yeah, you know, although it varies over the planet, as far as we're concerned, for the purposes of a particular bend, it's a constant. And that's a constant. But this bit, I'm trying to draw a question mark. This bit, we have no idea what it is. There are ways of working out what it is, but as we drive along, it's constantly changing because of those conditions that we talked about, how wet it is, whether it's snowy, whether it's icy, what the condition of the road is, and so on and so on. So we never know quite what that is. Now, if we're a racing driver or a, you know, whether these people who are particularly skilled on a track, or for that matter, um, uh, rally drivers, are quite skilled at getting just to that point and just feeling when they're going over that. Because although I'm saying that is the absolute theoretical maximum. There is a point when the car is starting to skid and the tires are just starting to not obey those rules, that kind of envelope. And drivers like that who are on the limit of adhesion can feel where that is and just back off very slightly. So with a lot of skill, that can be, that done. Can be done. Now, I can't do that. Um, you know, for ordinary mortals driving on ordinary roads, we need some other method. So why the heck, how the hell do we manage to drive along every day without flying off and misinterpreting what that speed is? Well, mainly because we don't use that at all, mainly because when we're driving along, we base it on visibility instead. We say, oh, I can see up to this point up here and um, therefore I need to stop by the time I get to that, be able to stop by the point I get that point. And in nearly all conditions, that is a lot slower than the theoretical maximum that I could go through there. If I was a racing driver, I may be able to do that bend at 100 miles an hour. But I'm certainly not going to do that in my ordinary car, in ordinary conditions, with the risk of somebody coming the other way. And the bottom line remains... I still don't know what that is, that mu factor, that coefficient of friction, and therefore what the speed will be. Now, there are various techniques for working that out. Um, if you investigate crashes and stuff, there are sophisticated equipment and things that can measure it and all sorts of things. But there is, a, there is an empirical technique. You can try this. Um, I'm going to call it the boy racer technique. And it works like this. Now, if we re rearrange that uh, formula, V squared over GR, we can find what mu is. Okay, stage one. Stage two, we go over exactly the same bend, 
at different speeds. So each time we increase our speed incrementally, let's say by five miles per hour, until the radius driven no longer matches that of the road. At which point we found that magic speed, we can plug all the numbers in and we can find out mu. The problem is it's slightly too late. Now, okay, I am being slightly facetious here, but this is actually kind of what happens. Now, when I looked at this, and I spent quite a lot of time looking at the statistics and the research on this one, single vehicle collisions, so no other car involved, 33% of all accidents, which is quite a high number really, because you generally we think of accidents of colliding with another vehicle. I, I know there's a, you shouldn't really use the word accidents, we should say collisions or crashes or something, but I, I'm using it interchangeably now. But there's a few, not, there's a lot of anomalies actually with these accidents. 81% of them are male drivers. And they're often young. And the peak times are weekends, particularly Friday night, and late. 11 p.m. onwards to midnight. And I thought, well, obviously, it's people get used to the road conditions and then suddenly that coefficient of friction changes because it's rained or it's suddenly muddy. They go around a bend they're, un they're familiar with and now it's got a different uh, coefficient of friction. And they go, no, 80% are dry conditions. So something weird and wonderful is going on with these. And this is the startling statistic for me. For drivers under the age of 30... Now, think about that for a moment, under the age of 30. Um, okay, some people under that age will die of disease or illness or something, but it, it's rare, it's pretty rare. So most people who die in that age group, it's due to road collisions. Half of them, it's due to accidents on corners and bends. That's a startling statistic. Uh, half of the fatal accidents were caused by loss of control on a bend or curve and four times as many on rural roads. This is why this is important. Now, actually, when I dug into this figure, it's fatal collision. It doesn't necessarily mean the driver was the one that was killed. Um, young drivers are quite good at killing their passengers, and this is more tragic because very often their passengers are younger than them. They're, of course, they're the first one to learn to drive or something. So this is, this is really quite a, a, a tragic, literally a tragic um, condition. But you might think, well, for those that survive it, they've learned a valuable lesson. Now, this is from police interviews. The, the study that I took those figures from also had some interviews with people who had crashed and were interviewed by the police after this. And this is why they thought they'd crashed. I wasn't doing anything wrong. It just went. I wasn't going too fast. It just went. Well, I was all right yesterday when my friend drove around it. I feel it was because of the road surface. So basically, they have no idea what just happened to them. Um, now, the one at the end, I feel it was because of the road surface. It's getting there. It's because there's coefficient of friction and so on. And the fact that we, we don't know what that is. But they're not really learning by that experience directly. They might if they're sensible, go a lot slower around those corners, but they really haven't got an idea with this. Now, when we look at it, it's quite popular to say, oh, well, young people are quite reckless. They have you know, a different attitude to uh, safety and so on. And in some of the cases, it is recklessness, but that can't really explain all of it. And this has been intriguing me. This is partly why it's taken me about a lot longer to prepare this talk. I spent a lot of time reading various research things about it. Anyway, I'm going to digress. Back in 1985, when I first joined the IAM with a really good group up in Warrington, I think it's still going, but I, I, which, but I commend them uh, at that time, was had a lot of social activities as well. And while I was still, I think I was still training as an associate, I don't think I passed my test at that stage, they had there was a, an open day, open day, a skid pan day anyway, at 
uh, anybody from Manchester, it was off uh, at the bus stop depot off Hyde Road in Manchester, which had its own skid pan for double decker buses. Uh, I, is that a comment from the dog? <laughs> no, he always barks at buses. Um, and it was it was very good, but you could drive your own car. I didn't get to drive a double decker bus on that occasion around the skid pan. That would have been dramatic. What I got to drive was my car, a Polo VW Polo Mark One, Woo, nine all nine hundred CCs. But I got to drive my own car because they hadn't invented health and safety and stuff in those days. So it was it was good. You get to drive your own car, and I was teamed up with a mentor who was actually a, a police driver about the same age as me um, from, he, he actually was in Sheffield. He's very good. I learned an awful lot from him, but the things, the messages I took away on that day were you don't have skids, you make them in some way. Something you were doing caused the skid braking, turning uh, or accelerating. Something caused it to, to happen. And the thing I learned, on that skid pan was very much like what I've just explained. There is a very definite fee speed, below a magic speed. Below this magic speed, you won't skid. From memory, I think it was about 18 miles an hour on that prepared skid pan service. Below that, 17 miles an hour, you could drive around it all day, no problem whatsoever. As soon as you got above 18, there was a kind of, depending on what you were doing, it would suddenly break up. By the time you got to about 2022, 20, you would just whiz straight off it. If you got onto the skid pa skiddy area, there was no control whatsoever above that speed. And that in itself was an interesting lesson. But then we, oh, that's the other thing. You don't know what the speed is until you try it. And the other thing was we learned all sorts of techniques. We learned things, uh, three different ways of cadence braking, uh, which obviously now ABS braking will do far more efficiently. And then there were, techniques for controlling a rear wheel skid and steering into it and um, other ones for front wheel skid getting the wheels moving and so on but they are skills which you have to practice and so on if you're going to do it you have to be very quick and that part of the training is that you react to that feeling the seat of the pants thing and doing it really quickly before it fully develops you've got to be very gentle with it and you've got to be fairly close to the magic speed. No point hurtling across here at 40 miles an hour. The best, you're just going to go straight over and off the other side. So it's got to be close to that magic speed. So the real lesson was just don't make a skid because you really don't know how close it's going to be. That was a very, very informative day way back whenever. All changed now. Back to the plot. All changed now, but we have got a lot of electronics doing stuff in the car for us and acting very quickly. So, but it's back to that thing. It still can't override the laws of physics. If we come hurtling at too fast a speed, there's nothing the electronics can do to, to uh, alleviate that. When I looked back at those statistics and looked at some of the reports into why young people have these accidents, they realized there was almost two phases of it. One sort of accident was they came up to a bend and they appeared to do almost nothing. They plowed straight across and into the scenery on the other side. If they were lucky, it was a ditch or a hedge that absorbed some of the energy. If they were very unlucky, uh, and depending which way the bend goes, it was either a tree or another car, um, which sometimes means it didn't show up in the statistics because technically it's not a single car accident anymore but it's essentially the same. And the other sort was they tried to make some sort of uh, correction. So steering at the last moment very hard or braking very hard, because usually that's the only thing their, experience, their training has taught them to do. If something doesn't look right, you brake. Um, and sometimes they initiate a partial recovery that might actually make the skid go in the opposite direction or make it worse. Now, the, the upshot of that was often the second category landed up colliding with something, the car or the tree, but going in the wrong direction. So go the back end of the car hitting first or the side of the car. And depending on the car, obviously bigger, more expensive cars have side impact protection and side airbags. Small hatchbacks traditionally haven't. Things are changing. So sometimes the injuries in the second one were worse 
than the just piling straight into it at full speed, as it were. It's still quite weird. So I've sort of classified this as doing too little too late. And this one is doing too much, but too late. So there's one common factor here. They're too late. And this still doesn't make any sense to me. So because these don't match ordinary accident statistics. Usually, if you look at overall accident statistics, they happen when there are more cars about, more traffic. You know, the more cars there are, the more higher the probability of them bumping into each other. It's essentially as simple as that. So overall, traffic, there tends to be more accidents on weekdays. There tends to be more in the morning commute and the evening commute, whatever that is, seven o'clock till or six o'clock till nine o'clock, whatever. But those tend to be, and weekdays, peak times that generally speaking that's when there are more accidents but these don't these happen as i say they happen at weekends and they happen later more frequently later they can happen any time but they they more frequently at those times and there's some other factors the reason for the journey um tends to be social if it's that time or not right now they're going to the pub back from particularly back from the pub back from a club back from footy what Ever, something like that, often with more people in the car, which is why they, uh, the, uh, the fatalities actually go up. And actually why the insurance claims go up, because if you've got to pay somebody's uh, a payout for injuring somebody very severely and they're only 17, it tends to represent what it will require to look after them for the rest of their life. Um, typically their age, experience and skill are low. Now sometimes these are all conflated because actually in the accident statistics it doesn't measure how long they've been driving or what their skill level is. It does measure their age. You can make a bit of an assumption that if somebody is 17 they haven't been driving that long because they must have passed the test after their birthday. And likewise somebody who's 18 you know it's, it's not they haven't been driving for years and years. What we can't assess is what their skill level is or what experience they've had in that time. So it, all of the um, studies blur that one a little bit. What is clear, and we probably know anyway, is where do they get their view of what good driving is and who is a good driver? Well, like everything, well, think back for when you were you get it from your peer group, you get it from other drivers your same age, the person who's got the, I don't know, sporty car or whatever, but, Although you do take information from your parents and other factors, it tends to be your peer group, your friends, your mates, people on Facebook, whatever it is. And given that they're in the same set, they're also young, also therefore limited in experience and possibly low skill level. On what basis do you rate this driver over this one? And it tends to be in the studies how confident they are. I thought about this a lot and I thought, Do you know, that's exactly how I rate lots of other things. Now, I might rate a politician about how confident they sound about something because I don't know anything about the subject they're talking about. I have no other way of evaluating it. So I base it on how knowledgeable they sound, not necessarily on their actual measurable skills. So we can imagine the young driver who drives around complaining about driving reasonably confidently, but complaining about the numpties on the road and look what they've done and so on, don't necessarily have the skills they just appear to, to their peer group. What do we teach? What do we teach? Quick change of, uh, well, we teach uh, about gaining information, better observation. We talk about uh, being able to look for things like hedgerows, telegraph poles, anything that will give an indication of how the bend develops. We look at signage, the actual bend signs, double bend signs and so on, paintwork on the road, slow hazard warning lines, and of course chevrons and so on. We talk about position, positioning for safety, so we're not in the firing line of anything coming around the bend, but 
if we can, we'll move out to the outside to get a better view. And for that matter, increasing that radius is going to help for the physics that we saw earlier on. We'll control our speed. So as we saw, slowing down on the straight is going to be better. And then we can drive around. Um, slow in, fast out type technique. So by changing gear early, we can use the acceleration when it's safe to do so and when we know what the situation is. And we can balance our acceleration through the curb. We know this. This is bog standard stuff. Let's, here's, here's an example. Um, so driving along here, doing about 60, there's a bend, bringing the speed down, bringing the speed down. Now we come into the bend, driving around at pretty con, a little bit of power to come around at constant speed. And eventually the bend opens up like this, and so I can pick up the speed. I hear the engine moving. So that tends to be what we do. And one of the factors within that is limit point analysis, which again, I'm sure we're all familiar with, but it's basically saying, here's a bend. The two sides of the road appear to come together. I need to be able to stop on my side of the road. There's a magic point about there. That's as far as I can see. I would have to, at the moment, this point in time, I would have to stop there. So effectively, that's doing job number one, which is to dictate my speed. Of course, I have to know how long it takes me to stop in a given period of time, but usually we're reasonably okay on that one. And the second thing is indicating the tightness of the bend as we approach it. So we've got a distance in there. I am um, looking at that distance. Is that distance from there to my car getting shorter, longer, or staying the same? If it's getting shorter, then I probably need to slow down until such point as that remains constant and then I'm probably at the right speed. And when we get out the other side and it suddenly starts elongating again, well, then I can gradually pick up the speed. So let's have a look at that. Here's exactly the same. I've slowed it down, just gives me a chance to talk about it as we go through. This is about half the speed now. Not that I drove any faster, just slowed the video down. So we can see that there's a bend there. But that limit point really isn't moving. You know, look at the hedgerow and stuff. So I'm slowing down slightly. At about this point, it's now going away from me. That distance is pretty constant. We've got a kind of triangle there. It's That picture is remaining constant. It's going away at the same speed as I'm arriving at, at it, if that makes sense. And about here, now it goes way down the road here, so I can start to pick up the speed. Now that's essentially what we're teaching. That's the limit point and the two jobs of the limit point analysis to be part of that analysis. Contingent on that, as I said, we need to know how long it takes me to stop. And <clears throat> how does that, well, how, what does that depend on? Well, the speed of the car, obviously. Coefficient of friction, our old friend mu, which as we said, depends on the tires, the road service and anything between those two. And we don't know it. Uh, same story again but also how much grip is being used for cornering because we saw that uh, as soon as we use some of the grip for cornering then all of the tire is now moving at an angle it's kind of skidding and therefore we haven't got all of the availability of the grip for braking and so on so there's a sharing between the two now a bit more we haven't had enough physics yet so we uh, we need to go back to the science lesson First law of thermodynamics. Come on, anybody. Uh, Henny, uh, first law of thermodynamics. Energy can neither be created or destroyed, but we can convert it. We can convert it into another form. We can convert it into heat. Excellent. So if I'm wazzing down the track in my Ferrari uh, and I've got a certain amount of energy, and that's kinetic energy, moving energy, and good old A-level physics, or O-level physics, I think, that's, by this equation, half mv squared. So the mass of the car, every time I increase the mass, then the amount of energy I've got increases as well. But pretty much the mass remains constant. But the speed, the speed, every t time I double the speed, I quadruple the amount of energy. Now, when we brake, we're converting that energy you see that 
orange glow there like a one bar heater on an old fashioned fire that's the energy that's the heat energy on this ferrari as it gets rid of all of that energy so imagine there's one on the other side there's one there it's like a four bar fire getting rid of energy but every time as i say a double the speed quadruple amount of energy we've got to get rid of in consequence it takes much much longer to slow down from a higher speed than it does from a short one. I'm not going to go back over stopping distances and so on, but essentially the braking distance is proportional to the speed squared, not the speed, but the speed squared. And that's why stopping distance gets so much longer as the speed goes up. And this is what sometimes catches people out. But the bottom line though, of this is a small difference in speed can make a very big difference in the braking distance. So if the magic number for your bend was that you could take it quite happily at, let's say, 40 miles an hour, but you've had to break down at the last minute and you do it, you come into it at just over that magic number, you may well suddenly lose it. Still haven't answered the question of why young people are having so many of these accidents because it's a bit of a mystery. More than something like 97% or higher now take professional driving lessons, or at least some professional driving lessons. And some instructors are better than others, but I think all of them would notice if you kept leaving the road on every bend. You know, they, it's fairly fundamental that you can steer around a bend. So they've got past that stage. And for goodness sake, by this stage, they've passed their test. And interesting statistic those who pass fast time the proportion male versus female more men pass first time male young males 49.6 pass first time but it's the same group who are going on to crash on bends young males so passing first time and being god's gift to driving doesn't actually make you a better driver it's the same the statistics show that so the passing a driving test isn't a predictor for this sort of accident there are plenty of warnings on the road bends signs and so on and then there's the actual observation of the bend itself what other traffic's doing chevron slow warnings on the road so something else is happening there's lots why after all this stuff are they still doing this now looking at the evidence it comes down to distraction but i'm using that in a very general sense um the most obvious one is passengers there are many more accidents when there are a group of passengers in the car we've probably heard that one before mobile phones but of course mobile phones aren't just phones anymore haven't been for a long time social media texting other sorts of messaging going on um Alcohol and drugs, not massive, but it's an illness. Because the cars under these circumstances are often being used for social purposes, coming back from football, coming back from a club, coming back from a pub, whatever, there is more chance that their, their brain activity is distracted by alcohol and drugs that are below par. Attention and boredom. Um, I don't know if any of you have got teenage children or have had teenage children or if you used to be a teenage child. Uh, you know, constant thing, oh, I'm bored, I'm gonna go out. we're going to go out for a drive or something. It can be an inattention to what's actually going on on the road. And that can also lead to an idea of pushing the envelope. Putting themselves in a dangerous position just to see what happens. And finally, tiredness. Now, they seem to have limitless energy until it's first thing in the morning and getting up to go to college or something but if these things are happening quite late at night although they have more energy than me age 60 um it's not limitless so tiredness many more of these accidents happen on the way home from something than happen on the way there which is sort of telling so these are all sorts of things so how do you get around it well it's an attitudinal thing how do you change that well the more I've looked at it, my belief is we should move to a more graduated license. My son 
well, he's outside of that, he's in his 30s now, but lives in Canada. He lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So I've just taken one example. There are ways of doing graduated driving license in lots of different countries. Um, Canada happens to be one of them. It changes province by province. British Columbia is one of them. And the way you learn to drive there is similar. Actually, at age 16, you can apply for a uh, a learner license, they call it. We'd call it a provisional license. But you have to do your theory test and have an eyesight test before they will give you that license. So right up front, you have to have done the theory and the eyesight test. And then you can only drive with a supervisor, obviously instructor or parent or whoever, but they've got to hold a license and they've got to be over 25 years of age. So absolutely nobody in that young cohort can can supervise your driving. Um, like here, obviously, they've got alcohol and drug laws and so on, but they're even tighter for young drivers. Absolutely zero alcohol, zero drugs, and no electronic devices switched on in the car. Um, and there's a curfew, not from midnight till 5 a.m. Now, after you've got that stage, there's an intermediate stage called a novice one. So after a year, you've got to have held this license for a year. So you've learned to drive in that. And it can be reduced if you do an approved course to six months. But either way, you've got to have a significant amount of experience. You can take a driving test. They call it a class seven. Not quite sure why. And you get a novice license from this point. And with this, again, you've got the restrictions on zero alcohol, drugs, and electronic devices. You have to display an N on the back of the car. And I, I love this. It said, what happens if, I looked on their website, what happens if the N falls off or something? That's fine. Look, you can call into any licensing office, any driving school, and they will give you a free one to put on the car. So, oh, and by the way, here's a PDF you can download and print one off. <laughs> so in the intermediate, there's no excuses. It's just very pragmatic. This is, this is what you do. Um, you can only have one passenger unless, they're, unless you're being supervised by somebody over 25 or it's immediate family. So you can still take your brother to, work, to, to school or something or, or your mum down in the shops or whatever, but um, it's strictly controlled. Interestingly, I found this one. Here's a Lamborghini, whatever. God knows how much this costs, with an N sticker on the back of it. So this is your novice driver in a Lamborghini. It doesn't stop you driving something weird and wonderful if you can afford it. Anyway, um, after this, if you've been, you can drive on this N license, I think, as long as you like. But if you want to convert it to a full license, you've got to have a clean record for 24 consecutive months. So no violations, no speeding tickets, no nothing for 24 months. Um, obviously, all the usual traffic laws apply as well. You know, they could get a ban, they could get all sorts of things, but uh, this is over that they can't get that license. And then they pass another driving test. I think the driving tests are similar, standard and so on, but they've still got to be driving at a good standard after that. And it's basically elongated the period from sort of, which could be in this country if you did it really quickly, less than a fortnight, if you did your theory test and then you did a week long intensive course and then passed it straight away, you could do it in about a week. This is about three years. But what it's aimed at is during the risky period, you don't have the distractions and so on, and you don't drive at the dangerous times and you've got a minimum amount of experience that you've gained. It's all about gaining experience. What can we do in the IAM about this? Well, I think we need to reach young drivers, for, and we really aren't very much. Um, we can align with road safety com campaigns. Here in Northampton, we aligned with one called Roadcraft, which is sponsored by various road safety charities, but particularly is uses money from speed awareness and similar courses to put on events around here because we're close to Silverstone, they tend to be at Silverstone and it has a classroom session. It has a driving section and it also has a bit on the skid pan um, there for young, also people coming up to learning to drive people who've just passed uh, as well within that. And we, we found it doubly useful because 
we might sign up some of the young drivers, but we have quite a lot of success with their parents. Because the ones who are about to start driving lessons, often the parents think, oh, well, I ought to brush up my driving if I'm going to, uh, going to help uh, son or daughter with, uh, with practices and so on. Another one I thought of was a, few, a couple of years ago now, I um, did some uh, experimentation of putting these telemetric boxes in existing members observers cars and what I heard was we had some really good scores as you'd imagine um, in the upper quartile of the sort of results. Now as far as I can see and I'm willing to be corrected not much was done with that but more and more youngsters uh, insuring their car with a system that's based on the telemetrics and in some cases they're paying their insurance based on how well they drive maybe that's a way in that if we can say look if you drive like this then you will not only be safe but you definitely will save money on your insurance because it's a bit of a moot point at the moment where they do with our current insurers and i think i am as a whole should support a graduated driving system so people gain more experience before they actually have a full license anyway as ever i've uh, i've talked much longer than i intended to so i'm now going to stop there that's me done and we'll just open up the floor for um more discussion just give me one second while i unshare this and uh, uh